This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. Hello, friends, and welcome back. Today I'm a little bit torn because I feel the need to apologize. It's taken me so long to record another episode of the podcast. Though I'm sure most of you understand that sometimes life sort of interferes with life. And one of the reasons I'm torn is uh, if I apologize for not recording as often as I would like, I'm aware that six months down the road somebody will listen to this and not even realize that this is a little bit late getting to you. For the past five weeks or so, I've been involved in ministry traveling quite a bit. I was with a mission team in Romania. We served in a variety of ways, and then I visited Montenegro, ministry partners there. And then I visited some dear friends in Denmark and then worked my way across to Estonia and then into Russia again. So now I'm in Russia at home. It's nice to be home. Very nice to be home. So I have a little bit of catching up to do before I get into the topic. Today, I'll be talking about the way that seems right, how God's ways are different from our ways. Like I said, I have some catching up to do. I had a few things that crossed my desk. I've had some tabs open on my browser, (laughs) emails set aside so that I can talk about what's in them. So I'll do that right now, and then I'll get into the topic. Oh, and as a reminder, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to drop me a line at ancientpaths at cantrell.cc. And actually, I'll be sharing a couple of emails, two, I guess, today maybe three, two today, uh, from listeners who wrote just with a few thoughts, and I'll share those with you. First, though, I want to talk about a headline that I saw as I was reading the news a few weeks ago. The way these news aggregators work, there is an algorithm that'll decide what it thinks you want to read about. And so I've been fed these interesting philosophical and religious uh, news articles. And this one headline I saw... This is the headline, quote, A 2,000-year-old Chinese mindset can make you more successful. It takes almost zero effort, says psychologist, end quote. So that was the headline that I saw. A 2,000-year-old Chinese mindset that can make me more successful. Wow, that sounds wonderful. And it takes almost no effort, says the psychologist, who happens to be a Chinese psychologist. You can look up the article. It's um, mostly about just accepting the way the world is and realizing that you can't change things and that things are imperfect. But the appeal of the headline and the appeal of the article is there's this ancient path, a Chinese way of thinking, that can actually make us more successful. Of course, that's what everybody wants. And you don't have to work at it. It takes almost zero effort. Boy, that's just perfection, isn't it? And I thought, well, what would be the Christian version of that headline? How about this? Quote, a 2,000-year-old Jewish mindset that can lead you to die to yourself and enter into eternal life. It costs you everything, says podcaster. (laughs) The 2,000-year-old Jewish mindset that can lead you not to be more successful, but to die to yourself but in that dying can enter into eternal life. And rather than taking almost zero effort, it costs everything. And that reminds me of a quote by Jim Elliott, who was one of five men who was killed as he was reaching out as a missionary to a tribe of Indians in Ecuador. And before that, he wrote in his journal a pretty famous quote, and I'll give it here. Quote, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And then he quotes from Luke, the book of Luke, when Jesus is talking about using worldly wealth to gain friends. And, and then Jesus says, when that worldly wealth is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. To use the things that we have here on earth for eternity And that, of course, would be the true definition of success. 
So rather than embracing a 2,000-year-old Chinese mindset that can lead us to success and takes almost no work, let's embrace the 2,000-year-old Jewish teaching that will lead us actually to die and through that death enter into eternal life. And it costs everything. But as Jim Elliott said, he's no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Amen. Another thing I want to mention is uh, listener mail. I got an email from a friend over in the States. And I'm going to read his email. And it was a little challenging to me. And I'm, I don't think I'm going to talk about it in terms of resolving some of the challenges that I feel about what he wrote. But I want to challenge you just to kind of think about it. So my friend said that he's studying the book of Jeremiah and that he came across a quote from Campbell Morgan. Now, I didn't look up Campbell Morgan. I thought it was enough to look at the quote and not really do a lot of research into the person himself. So this is the quote from Campbell Morgan. Quote, The work of Jeremiah is like the work of every faithful preacher. His business is to create a sense of shame in the souls of men in order to place their corruption before them so as to compel the hot blush to their faces, end quote. <laughs> well, I tell you, that is a different idea of what a faithful preacher is supposed to be doing. I'll read it again. The work of Jeremiah is like the work of every faithful preacher. The preacher's business is to create a sense of shame in the souls of men in order to place their corruption before them so as to compel the hot blush to their faces. Now, I think that probably is a part of what Jeremiah's work was. John the Baptist certainly had that. He was calling people to repent. Perhaps the work of Jeremiah is like the work of every faithful evangelist. Though in our day, evangelism is rarely, very rarely seen as speaking to a person in such a way where they realize their lostness and their emptiness and their shame in their sin and being so distant from God. So then my friend continues, The corrupt people who heard Jeremiah's preaching were not influenced by his message. And that's true. Jeremiah brought the message, but the people didn't listen. And my friend continues, Is it not the same today? People seem to have no shame for their flagrant, sinful behavior. So here we have this idea that a part of a Christian's work is to create a sense of shame in people. Isn't that interesting? That's challenging to me. And now that I think about it, though, I had a conversation with a young man, and he was telling me about some things going on in his life. And as I spoke to him, I think he realized, well, he did realize his sinfulness, and he was ashamed of it. And I'll talk a little bit more about it here, actually, in the next little section I'm going to do. And my friend uh, finally wrote, after talking about this sense of shame and the shamelessness of the world today, flagrant sinful behavior, my friend wrote, The Holy Spirit convicts, but the bar of morality seems to have dropped drastically. And I will say that is true in my experience as I travel and meet people in different cultures. The Holy Spirit is there to convict us of sin, and yet in some cultures that bar of morality, the, the standard of morality, has dropped very low. And what was once considered to be just really terrible behavior is now sort of accepted. Well, let me tell this one story as an example of that. I was talking to a friend, this was several years ago, and she had moved to uh, Chicago and was setting up a new life there. And I asked her after a while, how are things going now that you've moved there? And she said, oh, I found a wonderful church. It's really great. Everybody is, you know, on fire. The small groups are wonderful. We've really had a good time. And then she said, but there's one thing. When I go to the small group, everybody gets drunk. <laughs> when she went to the home groups, all these on fire believers were getting drunk that home group. Uh, as we talked a little more, as I thought about it, I realized that's the culture for people of that age in Chicago. It's a drinking culture. And you want to try different alcohols, different whiskeys or wines or whatever. So that's come into the home group setting and everybody's drinking and then they're getting drunk at the home group. 
It's almost like, well, I could imagine the Apostle Paul writing a letter just as he did to the church in Corinth. Instead of First Corinthians, we would have First Chicagoans <laughs> and say it's not right to get drunk when you come together. <laughs> so this bar of morality has lowered somewhat, and we need to remember that God is calling us up into his character, into his personality, up to his level. And ultimately, his goal is, his purpose is, and what he's going to achieve, if we will let him, is to be sinless. Amen. That's where we're headed. A little while ago, I was talking with another young man in America, and it's on the issue of besetting sin. And this is a sin that just continues in our lives, even though we've been given freedom in other areas. Almost everybody listening to me has got something like this, that God has set you free in so many areas, and yet there is some sin or multiple sins that just keep coming up and they keep dragging us down. But there is one thing with which I want to encourage you, and this is what's helped me in battling besetting sins, sins that just keep coming up. And this is a prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. We know it as the Lord's Prayer, and this is a part of the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For years and years, I would just say the Lord's Prayer by memory, by rote, and not really think about it very deeply, or not apply it, not say it from the heart. And I'd read articles and heard people talk about this part of the prayer, lead us not into temptation. And some people think that that's a little awkward because it seems to be saying that God could lead us into temptation, but we're asking him not to. Now I understand this prayer, this part of the Lord's prayer for these besetting sins. Lord, please lead me away from temptation. Please deliver me from the evil one. Lord, my tendency is to move into areas where I'm tempted. My sinful nature, my desire to gratify myself, or just my weakness leads me into a place of temptation that then leads into sin. God, please lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. God, please, you be the shepherd. I need a shepherd to draw me away from this area of temptation. And that has helped me tremendously. And you got to pray that prayer from the heart in the moment when you feel that temptation beginning to grab you. Or in the moment when you realize, oh, I've gone so far. Lord, lead me away from this temptation right now. Please lead me away from it. Deliver me, God. I need you. So this part of the prayer, as we pray related to our besetting sins, is a recognition that we do need a shepherd. We should not try to lead ourselves away from temptation and then feel like we can hang out with God. We need to be with God. We need to be with the shepherd, and we need to submit to his leadership in the moment. So I wanted to encourage you with that. I've got a few other listener mail items that I'll talk about in future episodes, but I wanted to touch base on a few of those things there. So now we'll get into uh, actually the topic that I wanted to talk about today. And this is something that's been on my heart for quite a while now. And when I'm praying, often in a group setting, this will come out um, not from my mind, but from my spirit. And I found myself praying this in a group setting basically that God's ways are not our ways. Proverbs 14 verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. And I've been thinking about this quite a bit. And as I said, it's come up in my prayers, my public prayers. Also, certainly in private time, I'm thinking about it a bit. But When I'm praying with people, for some reason, it seems like God wants to remind us that his ways are not our ways. And that is going to be familiar to many of you from Isaiah chapter 55, starting in verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares Jehovah. 
As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. There is a way that seems right to people, and yet it leads to death. Oh, now that I think about it, I guess I dare say a 2,000-year-old Chinese mindset seems right. Make you more successful, you don't have to work hard, and yet it leads to death. Because God's thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are not our ways. And just as the realm of the stars is higher than my head, so are his ways higher than my ways. His thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts. We have to be humble about that. I've just been reading a biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and there's a discussion there when he was in seminary of the theologians of the time who were known as the liberal theologians. They didn't really believe that God existed, and they didn't really believe that the scriptures were God's revelation of himself. And as theologians, they thought they could think their way to an understanding of how God is or what is true. And Bonhoeffer and many others, of course, uh, believed what would be the opposite. God is really there. And in the scriptures, we find God's revelation of himself to man. And without God revealing himself to us in this way, we wouldn't come to it on our own. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We won't just come to them naturally. There's a way that seems right, but in the end it leads to death. Now, I did a series quite a while ago on two kingdoms. I encourage you to go back in the podcast feed, or if you're listening on the YouTube channel, to go find that series of teachings on two kingdoms. Right now, in the setting where I am, I'm in Russia. I've been traveling around Europe. There are military battles going on right now. Nations are fighting against nations. And even though there are these battles, this military activity, nation fighting against nation, when the Lord looks at creation, he sees two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. And again, I've spoken about this in the past pretty deeply. So please go back and listen to that series because it's been so helpful to me this understanding of how the kingdom of God is completely different from the kingdom of this world. It's completely different. It's a different economy. It's a different set of thoughts. It's a different mindset. In John chapter 18, starting in verse 36, Jesus is speaking to Pilate, and I've spoken about this in the past as well. Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. So there Jesus is saying, you know, I've got a kingdom, but it's not of this world. And it's interesting that he says, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight to keep me from being arrested. They would take up arms to preserve his physical body so that he could be in control. He could take authority. He could defeat the Romans, or whatever. But, he says, that his kingdom is not from here. It's from another place. And, of course, Pilate then says, Ah, you are a king, then. And Jesus says, Yeah, you're right. You're right in saying that I'm a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world, to testify to the truth. And here is this key phrase that keeps coming up. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me, says the Lord. Everyone on the side of truth listens to Jesus. A 2,000-year-old Chinese mindset may claim to be true, but if the person making that claim doesn't listen to Jesus, then they're actually not on the side of truth. There are two kingdoms. There's a hard dividing line here. There's, There's a hard line that is between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. And are we in it or are we not in it? We can't be lukewarm. We can't claim to be of the kingdom of God, but then bear worldly fruit. God is working in you, I pray. He wants to work in you and me, 
to clean out all that garbage so that we can enter fully into the kingdom of God. Now, it's real important that we understand that we are not, as followers of Jesus, we're not called to leave the world, which is pretty common in Christian circles. We are of the kingdom of God, and we're just going to leave the world and its kingdom, and we're not going to participate in it at all. And yet, in John chapter 17, Jesus is praying, uh, not only for the disciples that are there with him, he's praying for us now, followers of Jesus now. And Jesus says, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Those are the words of Jesus. As you listen to what I say, understand that my hope is in agreement with the prayer of Jesus, that you're not taken out of the world, but that you're protected from the evil one. Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, because we're not of this world. And Jesus is not of this world. And Jesus prays that we'll be sanctified. Sanctified means to be set aside. Amen. God wants to set us aside for his work and sanctify us by the truth. His word is the truth. And as we know his word, we are actually set aside. But we're not called out of the world. Jesus himself was sent into the world and he sends you into the world. He says, be in the world, but not of the world. So there are two kingdoms, and God is sending his people, starting with Christ himself. The Father is sending his people into the world, protecting us, setting us aside by the truth, because he loves people, and he desires for everybody to be saved. He loves everybody. And he sends us into the world. So just because we are of the kingdom of God, that doesn't mean we withdraw from the world. We go into it, but we're not of it. A little earlier in John chapter 16, Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. There's a little bit of a contrast here. Jesus says that he's told us these things so that in him we can have peace. In this world, we are going to have trouble. We need to be in him and have peace in him. And as we're in this world, but not of this world, we will have trouble because this is a sinful and broken world. And it's run by sinful and broken people. And there are evil forces at work that want to destroy the work of God. And we're going to have trouble because of it. But we can be encouraged. The Lord himself has overcome this world. And I've told this story in the past. Well, I think I've told this story on the podcast, but I'll, I'll tell it again. When I was at church in America one time, years and years ago, one of the members of the church came up right before Sunday school. We were out in the hallway. And she said that the Lord had given her a scripture for me that evening. And if I remember correctly, it was like, four o'clock in the morning, and then she couldn't go back to sleep. She was very animated, very excited, wanted to share this with me. Colossians 2. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. So that's Colossians 2, 6 through 8. And here again we see that we are to be rooted in Christ, living in him, built up in him. And being in Christ has always been a little bit of a challenging idea for me, because we're to be in him and he's to be in us, So uh, it's hard to think about. Obviously, it's a bit of a mystery. But I liken it to being in an airplane. Most of you listening have flown in an airplane. An airplane is a huge piece of metal. And to stand at an airport and see an airplane 
and say, yeah, I believe that thing can fly. Goodness, a a huge thing like that up in the air. Well, it's one thing to believe that it's possible. And it's another thing to actually step into the airplane and sit down in the airplane and then put my trust in the pilot, in the engineers, in the mechanics, in the physics of this airplane flying so high. And it really helps me to think that just as I can physically be in an airplane, I can spiritually be in Christ. I can fully surrender my life to him by being in him. And I can fully surrender the direction of my life, the speed of my life, (laughs) the timing of my life. Everything is fully dependent on his wisdom, his knowledge, his leadership. And as I'm in an airplane and completely entrust my life to the people and the physics and the mechanics and the materials, I'm inside that airplane. Spiritually, I can be in Christ, rooted in him, built up in him. And in verse 8 there of Colossians chapter 2, Paul says that we can be taken captive by hollow and deceptive philosophies. Dare I say hollow and deceptive Chinese mindsets. We can be limited, taken captive, enslaved through these hollow or empty or deceptive ways of thinking. These things that depend on human tradition and the basic principles of this world. Those things are going to bind us and limit us if we're just acting in ways that depend on human tradition and the principles of this world. We're not supposed to live by the principles of this world. We're supposed to live by the kingdom principles, the kingdom of God. Every culture has worldly influences which work their way into the church. I have traveled around Europe, the United States, several countries in Africa. Every culture has some worldly human traditions that work their way into the church. And we need to guard our hearts and make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit with our brothers and sisters. Dead religiosity says, I must be better in order to come to God. The living faith says, I must come to God in order to be better. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And again, I'll say, dead religiosity, human ways of thinking about being with God, just say, I must make myself better in order to come to God. Before the Lord will allow me to come close to him, I've got to be better. I have to be acceptable to him. And the message of Christ, the message of Christianity is that the only way that we will be acceptable to God is to come to him first, is to admit that we really need to walk with him. And then he will bring about a righteousness that is not our own. It's not a self-righteousness. It's a righteousness that comes from God through faith in Christ. Righteousness is is defined merely as being right, doing the right things, having a right mind, being right before God. And the only way that we can be right before God is to walk with him, is to come to him and say, Lord, please make me better. Lord, I surrender myself to you. So in closing, I just want to say, let's see to it that we're not taken captive by living according to this world's dead and deceptive ideas. Let us be rooted and built up in Christ, not depending on his teachings, not depending on his philosophies, but depending on Christ himself. Amen. Jesus said to his disciples, Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Thank you for listening, and God bless you all.